right, so chronologically, historically, we're looking at a, a day today that's called Palm Sunday. And so let me set the context. We're going to be looking in, uh, in, the, in the Gospel of Luke today. So if you want to turn to that as I give you a little background, we're in Luke chapter 19. Palm Sunday uh, speaks of the time in Jesus, what we call public ministry. When he, you know, born of a virgin, he lives this life up into his early 30s. And as he's living this life of difference, of, of change, of non-religious spirituality, he's, he's ministering to people and he's bringing the heart of a servant to humanity. He, he's teaching what the real nature of God is like. And so he's been doing that for about three years you know, in a public sense, in an in a, in a expressive teaching format, so to speak. But now he's, this time, he's leaving the area around Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum. He's traveling, you know, up through Jericho and going back into and approaching Jerusalem. This is just a few days before he will be crucified. And then he will be placed into, inside of a tomb. So that's what we call Passion Week. It, it starts with Palm Sunday. And to this point, he served with a purpose. He's even specified what that purpose was, it simplified it so we would be aware. In, in Luke chapter 19, he said that he, his purpose was to seek and save those who are lost. And so as he's doing that, he has not allowed his followers to proclaim him as king because his time had not yet come. But this day, Palm Sunday, he is declared to be the king. It's really a, a, a powerful shift, a change, if you would, because it, it's, it's just hours before the cross. And so he is letting people know, he is making this statement of who he really is. So let's read it together. I'd like to pick up in verse 28 of Luke 19. Read through verse 40, and then, as I mentioned, we'll come back and we'll look at some application of this text for our own lives personally as we look at the principles, the truth, the history, but then we'll see how it transforms our lives. Beginning in verse 28 of Luke 19, we read, When Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he drew near to Bethage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples saying, Go into the village opposite you, where as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. Verse 32. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Verse 39, and some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. All right, historical record, true story, took place 2,000 plus years ago. And when you read the Bible, I want you to read it with reverence, which means high regard, but also with a sense of, okay, now, how's this applied? If we're just reading history and we keep it categorized in that part of our mind that that happened before, we may struggle to find application in our lives. But if we can read history and then go, okay, so if I was there, what would I have seen? If this was all unfolding before me, what would... I take from it more, you know, in a sense, real life. So let's take a look at a few things. I think we can pull some things out of here that have application for us individually as followers of Jesus. Notice in verse 29 through 32 that as he's given this instruction to his disciples, he sent two of his disciples. 
he sent them. Really important. See, as a follower of Jesus Christ, God has selected you and me and every one of his disciples to be about his business. You have different tasks, different abilities. We live in different times of history, but you're looking at a 2,000 year window of these, what we call disciples of Jesus, a follower. And let me, let me explain a little bit about what a disciple is. A disciple is someone who submits to the teacher, to the, teacher, to the Lord, to the master. We see it culturally where people refer to it in sports as a, a disciple of this coach because they follow that kind of line. And we see it academically where philosophically someone's a, a follower, a disciple of a particular theory and thought. Well, that's the word that's being presented. It's that those who follow Jesus first come into a relationship with him. They're invited by him. Now, you can be a believer in Jesus Christ but not be a disciple. It's kind of unusual. You can't be a disciple and not be a believer. Now, a believer is one who has put his faith, his trust in Jesus Christ. We have various uh, approaches and ways that we kind of maybe help people take that step. But really, it's acknowledging that you need forgiveness as a person, as an individual. To believe in him is to believe who he is, that he is God, that he died for your sins, that he rose from the grave, that he conquered death and hell. And so he has the, the, the power, the ability to forgive you of your sins. But it's a personal choice to choose to follow him, to choose to believe in him, to say, Jesus, I turn from the way I used to live. I turn to you. I realize I need your forgiveness. I need you, oh God, to forgive me and to show me how to live, to give me this new life you speak of. So that's a believer. You know, some people would say you know, they would try to categorize as a Christian, and that term is bantered about so much you don't really know what it means. I like to go back to a follower of Jesus Christ, a believer, one who puts their faith and trust. So he sent two of these people who were, they were his disciples. They had come into a relationship with him. They were born again, born of the Spirit, and made choices then according to that new life. They're making choices to follow this one who, in this case, they have not seen the resurrection. They're following him because of who he is, because of his truth, and, and as we've seen, some of the mighty works that he had done. Now, back to you, back to me. We have a commonality with other disciples in history. We're unique, we're individual, we're united in purpose, but he empowers us and leads us, and he sent them. So who gets sent? Well, he has sent those who know his instruction, who know his word, who know his prompting. You know, some Christians would say, well, I don't know that the Lord's ever sent me. Now, don't, don't think of it as like physical relocation. Some people think, you know, oh, no, I don't know if I really want to surrender to God because then I'll probably, you know, he'll probably send me to, to Zimbabwe and I'll, I'll be living in a village and uh, nothing will be familiar to me because there's this perception that that's what someone who's sent is. They just get relocated to another part of the planet. It's possible, but not probable. The point is, he sends us. In this story, this situation, he just sent them down the road a little bit to go take care of a task he could have accomplished without them. Does God need two people to go find a donkey? Probably not. He could have just called the donkey and he'd have come. We could have. But for some reason, in his compassion and kindness and love and purpose, he has chose you and I as followers of Jesus Christ to be a part of his work, to, to, to follow his leading. So the ones he sends are the ones who are willing to hear his instruction, the ones who are willing to seek his word and to know his prompting and to obey. See, you can know these things. You can, be, you can read these things. But we have to understand, we do, we do see this in culture. There's a point where you do these things, where you step out and you actually obey. And so we see these guys, they, they obey. And notice this, in this case we see he gave them sufficient information and the ability to walk in obedience. Because they would have kind of been floored a little bit because it's kind of like stealing a donkey in a way, right? I mean, he says, go find this donkey and t unloose it and bring it. And now if you're going to go do that, there, you know, it sounds like you're going to hijack a, a donkey for, what? But he says, if he asked, the owner asked, we know, because Jesus is like, the owner's going to ask. And then when he asks, just tell him the Lord needs it. The Lord in this context is, is not as you and I would know the Lord Jesus. The Lord is a master, a, a teacher. And so basically they're saying some teacher wants it. 
And the owner says, okay, which is baffling. I mean, it seems to me like, which one? Sign a contract. We're not, I don't rent this donkey out. What's the deal? But do you see his, his disciples had received sufficient instruction to walk in obedience? And I'm sure when they're walking there, think about the conversation. You sure this is going to go down good? I mean, how are we going to cover ourselves? What if this doesn't work out? What if we get there and there's not a donkey? Disciples have these thoughts. What if we get there and they accuse us of, of stealing? What, what, are we, what are we going to do? I'm, I'm thinking that that's very possible, the discussion. But yet they get there, they have sufficient information. Notice in verse 32, those who were sent went their way. It's a reemphasis of a little bit of what I've already went over. But those who were sent went. It's important. You know, when we're sent out, we have to sort out what that means. Engaging the gray matter called the brain, thinking through the relationship with Christ, and taking a step. That's the element of obedience. When he sends us, believe that he gives us the information and everything we need to walk in obedience, and then take that step. Because those who went, those who, when they are sent, actually go, they experience something as as we see here. Sure enough, it was just as Jesus had said. Notice there in verse 32, it was, they went their way and found it just as he had said to them. Yes, we're looking at a case in history, a, a point that took place a couple thousand years ago, but it's a principle that carries true even today. His disciples, when we step out, when we hear, when we take an, an, a, a fearful sometimes, a, a apprehensive step of faith, knowing he's given us instruction to, to call a person, to contact with somebody, to resist temptation, whatever it is, when, when, we, when we take that step forward, we actually see that it's just as he said it was. In other words, it validates who he is. It helps us to take hold of it. If you go you will know. If you go, you will know because obedience reveals lordship. Sometimes we think of lordship, the Lord Jesus Christ, as just going out and doing things because he has the authority and he just tells us to, so we just do it. That's not the relationship. The relationship we have with Christ is he invites us to participate in his purposes. And when we respond and when we we step out, when we go, it, it reveals he knows what he's talking about. You know, who did he send? Did you, did you catch their names in this text? If, if you read in Matthew, and then you, know, you can take Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, and you can merge them in, in this story and synchronize them and find more details. When you do that, when you get to their names, you're going to find their names aren't there because you're not going to get to their names. They're unknown. They're like most disciples. They're not the top 12. They're, not, they're, they're, just, they're just two disciples. And the reason I mention that is because he uses the ones who choose to follow him. Sometimes obscure, sometimes anonymous, sometimes unknown, but he knows them. And who grew in their faith? I believe these two. Whether it was a man and a woman, two men, a young guy, old guy, whatever combo, whatever it was, I believe they grew. The ones who walked in obedience are living under his lordship. And the beautiful thing about that, it's not about comparing and competing. It's not about looking at what what one church is doing or looking at what one other Christian's doing and trying to emulate and duplicate that. We can learn from example, but we're to to, to walk in obedience, in in his lordship. What do you, you know, can you imagine, just kind of think it through, It's, it's not to be definitive, but what would it have been like to be leading this donkey back to Jesus? Think of the discussion you just had, because I think there might have been a little anxiety, I'm just speculating, a little uncertainty, like, oh, what are you guys doing? Leave my donkey alone. Uh, uh, the Lord needs it. Oh, okay, you can have it. Let's go, man, let's go. I'm tired, let's go. You know, I don't know, I'm just throwing it like real life possibility, but as they're walking back, they had to be wondering, like, that is exactly what he said. That we were walking here wondering if we were going to get in trouble. We're walking away enamored, fascinated by his lordship, his knowledge, his awareness. And why would he invite us to participate in this? And I believe at this point they still are somewhat apprehensive in the sense they don't really know all the details. 
Obedience doesn't demand full disclosure, correct? Because if God gave you full disclosure, you probably wouldn't do it. But instead, obedience is just a matter of response, knowing and then responding. So they get back, they don't know that he's going to declare himself to be king. They have no, that's, that's not in their mind. They're just moving through in obedience. So that's the discussion. Let's move on to verse 33 and verse 34. I love this part as well. Because we're told in verse 33, you know, as they're loosing this donkey, in verse 34, the Lord has need of him. What? If you need something, does that mean you lack something? Because that would indicate need. There's a, a, you know, you need this. The word there, need, speaks of has use for this, has a business for this, has a purpose for this. And so here, an obscure person who doesn't, we don't know their relationship in regards to Jesus, but for some reason they allow this donkey to be used for God's purposes. God has need of this. He's going to use it for his purposes. And my exhortation is hold nothing back. Hold nothing back. The Lord has use of it, use for it. And I would say it this way, two ways. Put your resources into his hands. And and then I'll say put your resources into his purpose. Let me distinguish between the two. Put your resources into his hands. See, we have stuff, right? Right? It's a weird time, really. I mean, just, do you know how many, like, I think like billions of dollars are spent on storage units? You know, that's what that is. That, that's where we put stuff we're not using right now. And then we pay someone to keep our stuff because we don't have a place for it, but we value the stuff even though it may not be valuable, but we put it in a spot and we store it. And we have all this extra stuff. And you know, owning stuff is not always a problem. It's when your stuff owns you, it's a problem. See, when the stuff keeps you from doing what you desire to do, it traps you and you're having to maintain it and fix it and prepare for the next part of it. And all of a sudden, your life orients around physical resources. They're actually starting to own you and have you. Good thing about this text, when we realize, I want to put my resources into his hands, we want to remember this. Contrary to culture, contrary to different continents and, and mindsets, It's not your stuff anyway, really. I mean, you can title it, and you can put your ownership on it, and you can get a legal backing, but it's his planet and his resources, and that's what you're working with. And in all reality, somebody was using many of those resources before you showed up, and if the Lord tarries, you're going to hand them off, or someone else will take possession after you depart. But who is constant? God is constant. And so I want to encourage you just to reset and rethink about resources, being willing to put them into his hands, put them, you know, your resources into his hands. Like, Lord, this is yours anyway. Now give me wisdom and how to manage it and be a good steward of it and also, you know, set it aside for your purposes. This is why I believe God teaches us about giving and about generosity, about offering to God. See, we give, the Bible instructs us to give tithes, which is 10%. It speaks of 10% of our earnings. Uh, give offerings, free will offerings, and we see need. Does God need those things? I mean, is he like not able to help people in need if we don't give them the money? I mean, you have a small view of God if you believe that's true. So we have to say, well, why do we even need to give in the first place? I believe giving and being generous and offering to God helps us to keep the proper perspective. In other words, it reminds us it's not my stuff anyway, and I don't want my stuff to own me. And so as we learn to give and and put our resources into his hands, then we see his practical uh, love manifested in so many ways. Now, I mentioned that there's putting your resources into his hands, and then I want to present to you putting your resources to his purposes. So acknowledging his ownership, he really is the one who's provided what you have and is leading your life, that's important. But then there's also this part of, now put it into practice, purpose. Putting resources into his hands is an ownership issue. Putting your resources to his purpose is a servant issue. It's saying, how can I serve? What can I do? What do I have to offer? And if you think about it, this text says the Lord has need of it. We know it wasn't because he couldn't command animals or couldn't, you know, he didn't have resources. We know it's because he has a purpose. He has a, has a reason for these people, these two d- disciples, and in this situation, the owner of the donkey. 
had a, a purpose for them. And so think about what, what do I have? What, I, what can I offer? What do I have that Lord could use as a, have a purpose? And, and you know, right now, some people have time and then they're able to, to give of their time. You know, we have opportunities in, in our culture where we were able to meet as a group, whether Bible studies or time of encouragement or prayer groups, or, but we haven't been able to do that now. But the time hasn't changed. That time slot that was previously set aside for group meetings is still present. Matter of fact, in some lives, many things have been slotted out and leave in a slot of time. We have a person who's been serving in our church and loves the Lord, that group time was taken away from her. She couldn't lead a group. But she was able to meet one-on-one -on -one in the jail through a glass with the people who she previously met with as a whole group. So now one-on-one, -on -one, guess what? Instead of letting the time slot slip away, she redeemed it. She realized this is a purpose. I could, I could use this time. And so she was able to actually just encourage people while they're incarcerated to renew their walk with the Lord or introduce them to the Lord. And guess what those people did? Those women then went back to the group, the pod they were in, and started sharing what they'd received. Do you see what I'm saying? It was just taking the resources and use them for his purposes. Whether it's your time, whether it's you know, what you have physically, whatever it may be, let, let God lead you, let him send you, and then choose to, to experience this and express this and live it out. So let's move on to the next couple of verses. Let's move on to verse 35. And they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. I want to present to you, this is a sacrifice of praise. Let me expound on that a little bit, dig into it just a bit. So commitment requires sacrifice. Truthfully, we know that in almost everything we do. If you commit to a, a vocation or a, a new approach to life, maybe a recreation, that commitment means you're going to have to give up some of your time and some of your planning to accomplish this new commitment. So commitment always requires sacrifice, and it's true in following Jesus as well. Now, the reason I call it a sacrifice of praise is because praise is expressed with more than words and songs. We notice here in this text that they give something. The followers of Jesus, the disciples and, and others that had been kind of maybe drawn in and are seeing this, you know, they give their clothes. Now, that culture, I want to suggest to you, was the true, one of the true minimalist cultures, a culture of simplicity. See, not excess. There was no extensive wardrobe. Rare, very rare was it to have a walk-in closet. Only the very, very rich, the elite. One change of garments, for many, one outer robe. Did you catch what they laid down? They laid down what they had. They were willing to give as a sacrifice their, 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 their garments, their outer clothes. And, and it's what I want to present to you is an element of unashamed adoration. Unashamed adoration does not draw attention to, to oneself. It does not withhold attention from God. So there's something that's happening, and we'll get into some of the details prophetically here as we move along. But it's not just the, the moving of a mob, so to speak, or the stirring of a crowd and the emotion and all that stuff drawn in. There's a much deeper, much bigger thing taking place. There's individuals that are realizing something's happening before them, and they're willing to be a part of it. You know, sometimes when we want to adore God or make a sacrifice of praise, maybe it's a singing out to him, which we'll see they do later. Sometimes we're, we're too concerned about what people think. We're too kind of maybe caught, and, and the result is sometimes we're not really interested in the kingdom. We're more concerned about what people will say about us. And your relationship with Jesus Christ, as it deepens and it grows, it's fully aware of people but it's more concerned about the love, the truth, the nature of God himself in the person of Jesus Christ. I wanna encourage you, you know, consider this, this term, this thought, unashamed adoration. Not, not concerned about getting attention, but rather directing attention, giving uh, adoration to God. And what they do, they join in the king's procession they praise him with what they have. They declare him as king. And they offer a sacrifice of praise. 
Continuing now, we see in verse 37, as this starts to move along, as they went, and he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice. Notice this. For all the mighty works they had seen. So that's a historical thing on an individual level. Some of these disciples have been following him for quite a while. And they've seen magnificent things. They've seen him walk on water. They've seen him calm storms. But those weren't the big things. The big things were when he looked at someone and had compassion upon them, for he seen them as sheep without a shepherd. He looked at a woman who'd been, been sick for most of her life, and his eyes met her, and he spoke to her as someone in need, not as a problem that should be set aside. He, the, the mighty things he did, they, that he did were people things when he engaged with people, when he called out the religious uptights and the do-rights, thinking they had the only way to God. When he called them out, that was a mighty work because he's upsetting, he's turning the table on this religious facade and this pretension. So these mighty works, and because of all these mighty works, they're, they're declaring, they're, they're making, knowing, making known. What were the mighty works? The same mighty works we see today. It wasn't just this this entourage, just a fascinating parade coming into Jerusalem. That, that is pretty, pretty phenomenal. We'll see in a minute. But part of the reality, as, he, as he's moving in, as, they're, 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 as, he's, as he's teaching people these mighty works, it's, it's sinners received love. Sinners who weren't in that culture welcome because those who had some diseases, illnesses, they were, they were outcast and put aside, even believing that that person's condition was a result of a curse of the Creator. Not knowing the truth, people pointed fingers and blamed and said, it's your sin that has caused this problem. But Jesus restored. He brought truth. He brought healing. Hearts were healed. Lives were restored. The, the other mighty work he did, as I mentioned, the fraudulent religious people were called out on their hypocrisy. They claimed to be representative of the Father, and they grossly misrepresented him for profit. And Jesus, that was a powerful work he called on them. The compassion of God was seen in the actions of Jesus. What's the application? It's simple, maybe. Remember his mighty works in your life. Christian, if you've been walking with Jesus very long, you've seen this. You've seen your heart soften. You've seen your mindset change. You've had more kindness stirring within you. You've had more compassion than just being taught to be nice. There's something beyond just learning a discipline. It's a life transformation that's taken place in your life, and it's a mighty work. You've had strength to resist temptation. You've had his calming presence when worry overtakes you. You've read the Psalms and, and found serenity as you just settle your soul before the one who made you, and it's a mighty work. So realize that that's happening and remind yourself. I think we have to choose to reflect and go back and remember the great things God has done. And that's what we see happening here. The expression then comes. We see in verse 38, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. There's this declaration. And this is not a spontaneous moment fueled by zealous followers of Jesus. This is a fulfillment of prophecy spoken some 500 years before. Uh, I want to glance over at a passage in Matthew chapter 21. In Matthew chapter 21, it's a quote out of the Old Testament of, from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And it reads this way. In Matthew 21, verse 4, all this was done, and it's the same context, it's the same story. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. This was a quote from the Old Testament, as we would call it. What we're reading about historically, what this story of the triumphal entry, this Palm Sunday um, narrative... It's a part of a much more intricate prophecy. A man by the name of uh, Sir Robert uh, Anderson wrote a book called The Coming Prince. And in it, he delves deep into the prophecies in Daniel. And he, and he breaks down and he brings to light some of these things that, that reveal the fulfillment of this passage. See, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, there was a prophecy. It said that there would be 483 years 
until the time that Messiah comes. So you're like, okay, and the prophecy is sometimes hard to like put a timeline on it. But this one gives us a block, a window to work with. We just don't know when it starts. So how can we conclude when it'll finish if we don't know the beginning point? But actually, we do know the beginning point. In Nehemiah chapter 2, in verses 7 and 8, Nehemiah approaches King Artaxerxes. Nehemiah is stirred with compassion because his people who are in, in Jerusalem, have, they're, they're inhabiting the city, but the walls are broken down and it has not been restored. And there's a decree issued by the king he approached, King Artaxerxes, issued on March 14th, 445 B.C. So that decree to go forth and rebuild, restore Jerusalem get us a, gives us a starting point. That's when this Daniel 9.25 prophecy can be put into motion. So if you take the 483-year period, and you have to consider Jewish calendar and Gregorian calendar and 360-day calendars and 364-day calendars and leap year, you start getting into all this. You know, the easy conversion that helps the process is to convert it from years to days. In converting it to days, you take this 483-year period, convert it to 173,880 days. That brings us from the start of the decree issued by King Artaxerxes to April 6th, A.D. 32, the very day Messiah comes into Jerusalem on a donkey, Palm Sunday, offering himself to be their king. What's the point? Well, the point is always this. Remember, God is on the throne. According to Psalm 29.10, the Lord sits or sat enthroned at the flood, and the Lord sits as king forever. This prophecy, this story we're reading about was spoken of hundreds of years before it happened. And it's a reminder to you and me that God is in control, that he is on the throne. The, the flood was the greatest natural disaster ever. And God was aware, God was there he was on the throne in the midst of it. So it's the same today, no matter how great our disaster, he's here. His disciples in this story will face a serious test in just a matter of days. It will seem like a disaster, agreed? You, you know the story. Here on Palm Sunday is a proclamation for Jesus to be made king. He is king. But as he comes in to Jerusalem and then later on Monday he'll, he'll cleanse the temple. He'll, he'll once again address this, this fraudulent presentation about who God is. And as he goes through that week leading up to his betrayal, his arrest, his crucifixion. If you're a disciple and you're seeing these things unfold, it seems that he is not on the throne. It seems that he is not the future Messiah. He is not the king to be. Rather, he is a defeated servant, a defeated carpenter who you thought would be someone else. And now he's placed in a tomb and disaster is upon you. Like this, Everything you put your hope in is history. But guess what happens? The tomb, the, the stone is rolled away. The tomb is opened up. The declaration of his resurrection is made known. And what seemed like a disaster and a tragedy in the first part of the week and towards the end is now changed on what we know to be Resurrection Sunday, which, of course, we'll be celebrating that next week. This isn't just a spontaneous crowd. It's a fulfillment of prophecy that he came in as King of kings and Lord of lords. And later they will see that he is on the throne. Let's continue as I want to wrap this up in verses 39 and 40. Some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that even if they should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. There's a picture here that's present even today. When the mighty works are accomplished, when the declaration of his kingship is made, some will be like the Pharisees who say, Shut it, zip it, put a lid on it. Tell them to be quiet. Tell them not to say anything. And Jesus said, oh, I could do that. But the very stones of creation, the very objects of God who created them inanimately, they could spring forth with life instantaneously. They would declare this truth because this truth is to be made known. And so I want to set, present to you, we have a choice. We can live in opposition to the king with our lifestyles. 
You know these Pharisees, they were the religious ones who were supposed to have all the answers. They're the ones that, that were to present the truth to God, of God to people. But yet in their minds, they're totally right. They, they're convinced, oh yeah, I'm doing the right thing. But you know what? He's rebuking them. He's actually calling them out. Because although they pretend to have all the answers, they had no answers. And they were actually trying to hold back the truth that needed to be declared. And so we, have, we can live in opposition to the king or we can love the king. Just that simple, teaching us to love. Love, love the king. Why, why, how can we love the king? Maybe you've never lived in a, in a place, you know, a culture, we are a different government. But maybe some people have lived where there's a king and you're like, man, that king is not nice. He's not a good person. Listen, this king that we're talking about, the king of kings, he's merciful. He's compassionate. He's gracious. He's the king that you would want to follow. He's powerful, purposeful, victorious. He conquered death and hell. He rose from the dead. He showed himself to be God. He ascended bodily into heaven. He said he will return for his people. He is on the throne. And so I'd like to close out with Psalm 29. We're going to, have a, we're going to bring it up so you can take a look at it. I've already quoted it. But I want to close in prayer with Psalm 29, verses 10 and 11. Because it's a pr- very important reminder to all of us. And it's a very important encouragement. Greg's going to come up. I'm going to close in prayer, and then he's going to lead us in a song of worship after I have this prayer time. Thank you for joining in. I just encourage you, get to know Jesus. You, you Don't let these things around you keep you from him. Choose to know Jesus. Let me, let me read this verse, and we'll close in prayer. We read in Psalm 29, verse 10, the, lo- the Lord sat enthroned at the flood, and the Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. God, as we would read that and consider what we have gleaned and what you have revealed from your word today, help us, Lord, that we not be caught up with the cares and the concerns, that we not be distracted by the endless, endless news, which isn't really news, it's just money. Lord, help us to keep our eyes on you, to recognize that you are on the throne, You're the Lord of our hearts. You guide us and lead us. You have what's best for us. Teach us, Lord, what it means to walk by faith. We need your help. We need your strength. Thank you, Jesus, that you'll teach us to walk in peace, knowing your love. We need your strength. We ask these things, Jesus, by faith. We ask that you would accomplish your work in our lives for your glory and for our joy. In your beautiful name, Jesus. Amen.